a lot today and through the whole uh, conference, we've heard a lot about these communities, right? Communities in the vicinity of parks um, and how they're often excluded from debates or passive in the depiction of ecological change. Um, Nelly also described so eloquently today about how these communities and stakeholder groups are not homogenous. So we need methods and we need engaging ways to capture this kind of pluralism. We're also, we've talked about this a lot as well, about um, the, the knowledge hierarchies that we're involved in um, and the challenge of co-creating knowledge on equal terms with these communities. So we found that participatory uh, photo-based methods are really a way to, at least one way, to mobilize tacit and contextual knowledge um, and experiences of this diversity of stakeholders. So today I'm gonna just divide my time into two. The, the first part is really to just give you a bit of a background about what are photo-based methods in participatory research. And here I'll give you a few examples from my PhD in the Eastern Cape that Jess also touched on in her talk. Um, and then in the second part, I will um, talk about our current research, which we're just, just starting. My uh, lovely research colleague is in Hootsbreit at the moment, interviewing people as we speak. Um, and I'll talk about some emerging insights from that work. So there are, there's a long tradition of, uh, well, a lot of academic traditions of using participatory photography in research, from public health and community development uh, to leisure research, sense of place, uh, and a lot of anthropology. One of these methods uh, is referred to as, as photo elicitation, and this is where researchers would bring a bunch of different photographs to uh, the respondents and ask, ask them to use those photographs uh, to answer particular questions, and it's using this visual media that engages our respondents to trigger responses that are that can be kind of submerged um, in verbal interviewing. So what, what these photos help to do is to stimulate memories and emotions beyond what happened to themes of identities or this is what it meant to me. Now, one of these um, methods within the sort of umbrella of participatory methods uh, using photographs is called photo voice. And this has quite a specific academic and advocacy tradition. Um, so with this method, participants identify uh, and express their own point of view by taking their own photographs of what they think is important. And then they develop a narrative for those photographs. This is most often done in focus groups, um, which then really uh, this methodology is drawing on Freire's critical education to uh, engage, engage learning and kind of critical discussion and reflection in a group. And then of course those photographs can be used to convey a message to uh, an audience. Uh, this method also is drawing on feminist theory uh, and and is then a way to kind of confront those power dynamics of participatory research by really putting the camera in the participants' hands. Um, and for me, as a researcher, that's quite a scary possibility. That means that I'm giving control over to someone else for my research. So it's kind of engaging with that discomfort that you were talking about, Steph. In advocacy, there's also a, a, a large tradition of um, methods and sets of tools in which um, particular NGOs are, are kind of training marginalized voices to be able to represent themselves um, in advocacy. So if you're interested in that, there's a lot of resources that I can tell you about. So what I'm gonna do now is just um, chat to you a little bit about a paper that we wrote in 2018, um, where we were sort of looking at how can photo voice be used in socio-ecological systems and conservation studies? And what we could show from our, our previous research was that photos really helped um, capture the tangible and intangible connections to ecosystems. So we talked about that uh, a lot today as well, about the importance of those kind of cultural connections, but how do you capture that? Um, we also showed that photo voice was able to really engage these different voices in the community 
to understand how people had different access to ecosystems and ecosystem services. Um, and that this was a way to kind of engage um, indigenous and local knowledge and a way to articulate the plural perspectives of these marginalized voices within communities. So, for example, this photograph on the bottom was taken by uh, one of my focus groups um, in my PhD. Uh, in my PhD, I was looking at, um, at landscape change, particularly due to uh, declining agriculture in the former Transkei. And in this research, the women of the community really used these photographs to say, we're still here. We are still using these resources, and, and this is our way of living. Um, and, you know, and, and to sort of show that there are different emotions associated with that. Uh, sometimes you'll feel happy in the forest when it's hot and you enjoy the shade, uh, but to be alone in the forest is not safe. Some of the photos were also quite surprising. So this photo on the right, I thought, oh, this is a lovely bucolic kind of um, vista. But actually, this woman used this photo to say, this, is, this represents anxiety for me. These fields used to be cultivated, and they're not anymore. So how is Photo Voice doing this? Um, well, what, what we're really doing in, in helping um, and facilitating that local participants come to us with the photographs um, is that we bring participants into the interpretation and the analysis. So we have a particular methodology for using the printed photographs to reflect in a group. And these printed photographs become this tangible and common understanding for building, um, for building further understanding. And what's so cool about this, about using photographs is that it helps us to overcome some of these cultural um, and literacy barriers. And of course, it makes um, photographs are, when you take a photograph, there's something special that happens there that you can, can use that in a way to represent something either of yourself or of yourself but through someone else. And I'll show you what I mean. So in this photograph, you can imagine I was, I'm a white woman who goes into the former Transkei talking to a group of young men about how they feel about declining agriculture and, and uh, declining job opportunities in the city. Um, and these men found that very awkward, right? How am I going to tell this white lady what's going on? So this guy took a photograph of someone else, um, who say, and he said he's not married because he's not working. To have a wife, the first thing you have to do is work and have some money uh, and some cattle to pay Labola. He has long been striving to get some work in the city to no avail. He feels bad to depend on his mother's pension grant because he is the son who is supposed to look after his mother. Now, this was the exact situation of the photographer as well, but through this representation, he was able to kind of um, emote some of that shame um, through a photograph and kind of distance himself uh, and engage with dignity. So that was the first part of my talk. The second part is, can we turn the lens on ourselves? So Chloe, yesterday you particularly asked a question about our positionality, like what is our role as conservation managers, practitioners, and researchers? Um, and in our new project, we, we are trying to use photo-based methods to, to elicit deeper reflections, empathy, and social learning as a way to, to understand um, and really dig into the inequalities that are preventing progress towards sustainable transformations. And how are we doing that? By giving the camera to conservationists. So this is just a little bit of context of, of how we're kind of framing the project. Um, I think I probably don't have to tell this to this uh, group of people, but biodiversity conservation in the Global South has been in the past a very alpha male, silverback kind of dominated um, arena. It's also been very dominated by settler colonial contexts and ideas, such as fortress conservation and green militarization. And there's of course been a lot of gender mainstreaming programs, and so what we're seeing is, is the emergence of new identities, and the silverbacks, the traditional silverbacks, are now working alongside, for example, this is a photograph of the Black Mambas, which is an all-female anti-poaching unit in the Lowfelt. So 
how do people experience that? And that's what we are really interested in. Um, there hasn't been a lot of research on the lived experiences, motivations, and practices of conservationists who are really living these shifts. So our current project looks at how do changing intersectional gender identities shape conservation practices, and how does that um, potentially contribute to efforts to diversify, decolonize, and transform conservation more broadly in the world. We have two case studies. The one is in Top End Australia, which we haven't started yet, and the second one is in the Greater Kruger in South Africa. And uh, here I'm, I'm going to present to you really some very early emerging insights. Um, and they come from our pilot study, which was Laura Bethia, our colleague's master's, pro uh, master's project, where she interviewed 18 women conservationists um, during the pandemic, and she used photo voice online. And it comes from, from our, um, the field work that's currently ongoing. Um, and yesterday I was still uploading a photo that was just, uh, and some, some text that was just given to me by Laura Bethia yesterday. So it's really, really hot off the press. Okay, so some of the emerging insights, we'll start with, there is still this perception amongst our respondents that the low felt landscape is heavily male driven. Um, particularly women talked about informal uh, discrimination around uh, assumed incapability, lack of knowledge, um, the, the sort of expectation to make sacrifice for family, um, social harassment, intimidation, and racial discrimination. And there was generally the sense that this sort of, these normative masculinities were hegemonic, um, and that the militaristic practices of conservation, I mean, the, you can see the black numbers in their military uniforms, um, is still shaping the kind of social norms and the expectations of, of which genders have which roles. Uh, what Laura Bethia's thesis found was that women are particularly performing these shifting gender identities in order to kind of cope and claim space. So what they're, they're doing then is kind of negotiating between these um, more masculine traits on the right, that side, sorry, <laughs> this side, <laughs> the blue ones, um, and the more feminine traits on the other side. So for example, negotiating between trying to prove physical toughness and demonstrating an emotional responsiveness, or um, developing public assertiveness and working quietly <coughs> behind the scenes, or adopting these kind of militarized approaches, but also developing inclusive over the fence, uh, sorry, beyond the fence kinds of approaches. So uh, this was one of the photos that uh, was just taken yesterday, um, but I had to include it because, uh, <laughs> because Louise commented on our shoes the other day and I thought there was <laughs> such an interesting um, parallel. So this, this conservation, um, uh, conservationist who is a woman said she took this photograph to represent who she is in, in um, conservation, and she says, it's my personality. I can be a lady in high heel boots with a tight skirt, but I can also be the typical bush person, conservation person that wears boots that are protective uh, because of snakes. And she talks about how she can sort of move between these, these different personalities and different aspects of her identity. I feel comfortable in all three of them, um, and I can adapt to these situations. This quotation at the bottom is from another of our um, uh, participants who has said, the way we try to become stronger and more aggressive in a competitive environment and in male-dominated industries like anti-poaching, it forces you to exhibit traits and qualities that push you to be on that level, to be accepted. How we can transform internally and use those masculine qualities to achieve certain goals if needed. But then she also talks about the, the uh, destructive aspect, the destructive effect that it has on her sense of self. Sorry. <clears throat> Sorry, I should have said the, those <laughs> previous photos were both from women, 
Um, and these uh, photos are from men in our current study. So in this one, um, we really see how photo voice is helpful in, in creative self-expression and facilitating a kind of reflexivity, kind of reflexivity we've been talking a lot about. Um, I see myself as kind of like these rafters, holding up a lot. It literally feels like a weight on my shoulders, and it's heavy. This gentleman was the, the head of an NGO in the Lowfelt. The, this church, this picture, uh, felt special. It felt like it was bigger than me, and it was just a small part of, of something vast that stood the test of time, which is also what I think about. If I die today, will my contribution to con uh, conservation, will it last? So uh, a lot of our respondents have talked a lot about how, how um, therapeutic, actually, the photo voice process has been. It's, it's been very humbling for us to hear that. We hardly, ever, uh, we hardly ever take time to actually take a look at ourselves and reflect. What I realized by the end of this process is that since I've become a manager, I spend a whole bunch less time in the field, and so I feel disconnected, and I'd like to try to fix that. <laughs> um, this photograph um, I, uh, is to show really how um, participants have also been using the photos to show us really what Wendy helped us to understand yesterday in the forest, that, that um, conservationists tend to, to look for these kind of beautiful moments um, and these uh, to sort of come back to their motivations and care. I love this at the end here. It reconnects you to the reason why you're there. Um, another thing that has come up a lot in these photo voice exercises is that photographs um, is really help to communicate what the moment feels like, sort of beyond all of our papers, which obviously have an important role, but to use these photographs to really um, build empathy for, for the subjects of conservation. Um, and then lastly, what I just want to say is, is the next steps in our project are going to be to obviously complete the, the current field work um, and potentially to, to see if there is interest in the garden route to do something similar uh, with conservationists in the garden route. And then in framing this work uh, going forward, we'll really draw on imperatives of racial transformation, but also trying to connect this, um, these big discussions about inner transformation um, and social ecological transformation, um, and really looking at could reflexivity be a transformative capacity. Um, and we'll draw on, there's a lot of research in photo voice, particularly in um, public health, that shows how empathy and learning within these photo voice groups, but also then in communicating the photographs, has created real change in the, the public health policy. So this is my open invitation to you. Would you use this method? And could it be useful to you in your own conservation practice? Thank you.